Turn, if you would, this morning to the book of John, chapter number 6, the book of Matthew. If, if, if you would go, when you go to John, chapter number 6, take your right-hand index finger, mark that spot. It's where we'll primarily be today. And then go to Matthew, chapter number 14. Use your pinky on your left hand to mark Matthew, chapter number 14. And then go to Mark, chapter number 6. No, don't, it doesn't matter which, it really doesn't matter which fingers you use, but uh, go to John chapter number 6, Matthew chapter number 14, and then we'll go to Mark chapter number 6. Also, we'll be talking about the same account that's found in Scripture, but we'll be looking at that from uh, different vantage points today. Uh, this is, most of you know, this is the sixth message in the series where we've been focusing on the seven primary signs or miracles. That was a sign right there, and there was light. Did y'all see that happen? Brother Jimmy, I saw that right there. But uh, seven signs of John's gospel, and uh, here again, also not only signs, but miracles, different versions translate the wording there from the Greek into uh, two different words, but also they're used together quite often, but uh, John's gospel is very, very clear. We have talked about it. That sounds like a baby crying right there. Amen, amen. That's what, that's what we need sometimes is just some food, amen. And so uh, John's gospel is very, very clear, um, and it, there was really one primary purpose behind the entire gospel. And that was what we talked about it for uh, several weeks now, so that people would believe. Have you ever tried to believe? How many of you believe? How many of you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Yeah. And, uh, and that's really what this gospel is all about, the gospel of John. But we have to believe and we have to have faith that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Uh, that, that sets the stage and the tone for everything that you will ever do and ever know as a believer today. Amen? Uh, by the way, I will say, if you've missed any of the other messages in the series, you can go to YouTube or Facebook, and you can catch any of those. But uh, here again, we're going to go first to uh, John chapter number 6. But let me ask you a question. Have you ever been fully convinced that you were walking in the plan of God and in the will of God, yet you found yourself in a storm? You knew you were a Christian. You were a believer in Jesus Christ, yet you found yourself in a storm. I mean, I'm talking about we know that God orders our steps. We know that God watches over us constantly. We know that he will never leave us nor forsake us. We know that he is all-powerful. He is all-knowing. He is ever-present. But yet, in the midst of life, talking about this middle thing, whoever said that a while ago, Renee, whoever said this, you know, this being in the middle, uh, as we're walking down this road of life, with God even, we find ourselves in the middle sometimes, Sister Renee, and we find ourselves... Uh, this is not politically correct, but we find ourselves in a stinking storm. Amen. Can I get an amen from somebody today? But you wind up in a storm. This is what always has gotten me. While fulfilling, or at least attempting, to fulfill the very will of God in your life. Have y'all ever been there? I mean, I, I've been there many different times. I, I could tell you, I won't for the sake of, yeah, I might, I might. I'm going to go ahead and tell this story right quick. So I've, we walk, children of God, you walk in uh, God's plan. God orders your footsteps and all this stuff. Amen? Amen. And so last Sunday I preached uh, about Jesus feeding the 5,000 and how we need to have our minds, our hearts on him. And when something happens in life, my question was, where's the first place that your mind goes? You know, does it go, in, as we would talk about today, to the storm, or does it go to Jesus? Is that the first place? And so, so we leave here last Sunday morning, and we had to branding iron to have lunch. We're sitting down 
Our food has just come out. My well-done chicken strips were sitting right there, baked potato in front of me. And anyway, I heard this, this crash outside. And uh, Sister Judy, I believe it was, sitting at the table, she says, I think that man just walked by and punched the drive through window at Branding Iron like he was mad or something. Well, then I noticed several people get up and they start heading toward the door. And I'm thinking, well, that's, something's going on out there. And so, so anyway, then one console walks in and we overhear him, Brother Rodney and I overhear him saying, you know, a motorcycle just ran into a guy's tan car outside. So I, I'm sitting there and I said to myself, self, my car looks a little bit tan could be considered tan. So Rodney and I, we walk outside, and sure enough, this guy had, had, we don't know exactly what happened, but long story short, he ran into the side back of my car, the, the back, back quarter panel, quarter panel of my car, crushed it in, police were called, here come three policemen showing up, a highway police, two city police show up, and uh, so by the time I got back inside, my food was already boxed up, let me rephrase, cold and boxed up. I sat down there at the table, though, because they're finished eating, and I sat down there at the table for just a minute, and, and uh, something was said, you know, about the sermon that I preached last Sunday morning about Jesus feeding the 5,000. What's the first thing you think of when something happens like that? And I was sitting there, and, and uh, all of a sudden, I said these words. I said, I have to be very honest with you. This is the first moment in all of this that I've thought about Jesus even once. <laughs> I'm just getting real with y'all. But anyway, of course, then I, I thank Jesus because here's what I know. I know that Jesus has a plan through all of this, through the aggravation, through the frustration. What's going on today with Jesus walking on the water is as much about frustration probably as they're out there. We'll talk about it in a little bit, but it gets frustrating in life sometimes. But I will tell you, Jesus Christ is still Lord and Savior and King of Kings today. Give him praise this morning, if you will. We're going to see today as we look to our text that there are times when Jesus knows exactly what you're going through. He even sees, he even watches what you're going through in life. And he even, I'll say this, he even allows it so that he gets the glory and that somebody in the process begins to believe. Remember, we're talking the whole book of John. We're talking the purpose of that was so that people would believe. And I'll tell you, if I have to go through something and if you have to go through something so that somebody would believe it's worth it. Amen? Yeah. Amen. But it's sometimes the storms and difficulties of life that actually push us in to the fulfillment of God's plans and God's destiny for us. We don't like, how many of you like getting pushed around? But it's sometimes within the storm that God allows those things to shift us and push us and challenge us so that somebody, I'll tell you what, if somebody today can hear this message and get saved, whether in here, online, in India, wherever, I will be happy about it. Give Jesus praise again, if you will. Well, let's look at the text and then we'll come back and we'll pull it all apart. Uh, before I read the text to you, though, from John chapter number six, let me just remind you about what we talked about last week. Last week, we talked about Jesus miraculously feeding the 5,000 men plus women and children. Uh, we remember that. How did he do it? He did that by multiplying the five small loaves and two small fish. And that had to be an incredible miracle. Yes. I mean, that had to be something else. I, I wonder, you remember they picked up 12 fragments, 12 basketfuls of fragments when that was all over. I wonder what they did with all of those. I've got an idea. I'm not a betting man, but if I was a betting man, I would say they saved them and they took them with them that evening. Just a thought, just a thought. Amen? They gathered all those up. But anyway, so all the men, we'll come back to that later. 
So all these men, you got 5,000 men, and, and they all, a bunch of them got together, though, and they realized, after they saw the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, they realized this is the prophet that Moses had talked about that was going to be coming later. They figured that out, and so what did they decide to do? They, they said, we need to get him, and we need to force him into being our king get a little bit of relief from Roman rule and various things like that. So they were about to take him by force and make him king. Let's go ahead and put that verse up there, John chapter 6 and verse 15. Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. Did you catch that double emphasis by himself alone. We'll see that again here in a little bit where the writer here, John, is making sure that we understand Jesus was by himself alone. Amen? So that sets the stage for what is about to happen. Verse number 16 of John chapter 6. Now when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into the boat, and went over the sea toward Capernaum, and it was already dark, and Jesus, now the end of this verse says something that I think is very important. It says, and Jesus had not come to them. You may be thinking, why did we, Jesus was alone. We understand that. They were alone out in the sea. Why does it have to tell us that Jesus had not come to them? In other words, John seems to emphasize at the end of this verse that the disciples were very, very much alone. Jesus was alone here on the mountain and Jesus had not shown up. Sometimes it feels like Jesus hasn't shown up in your life, but I just need to tell somebody today, he's on his way. Amen. He's on his way, amen? Verse number 18, then the sea arose because a great wind was blowing. The Sea of Galilee, some of you know this, but the Sea of Galilee, for those that have been there, you know that it is surrounded by mountains. And so oftentimes, especially as the, as the cooling down takes place in the evening, there's, there's a lot of wind that gets started there. And so it's not uncommon at all for there to be a storm that rises up. Verse number 19, so when they rode about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near the boat and they were afraid. But he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. Then, verse 21, they willingly received him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. I wonder if John is pointing out in this last verse that you can get to where you're going a whole lot faster if you have Jesus in the boat with you. I just wonder. So far in this series, we've looked at raising Lazarus from the dead. We've looked at turning water into wine in Cana. We've looked at healing the nobleman's son in Capernaum. We've looked at feeding uh, or at healing the lame man in the pool of Bethesda and then feeding the 5,000, uh, which was near the Sea of Galilee where we're at today. And so today, today we're talking about Jesus walking on water. And how many of you love this story? I mean, everybody loves this story. You get this in Sunday school, you get this in preaching or whatever, but I love this particular chapter of John a lot. I mean, you think about it, we've already studied the thousands have been fed, and I know that at some point the crowd had to be thinking, this is way cool. At some point, they've got to be looking around. Jesus is breaking the bread, and he's divvying it out to the disciples, and the disciples are giving it then to the people, the bread and the fish. He's doing all this, and it's never running out. He just keeps on giving out more and more and more. You, you just can't tell me that at some point, some of the people start going, Wow. Have you ever been in a, a church service, or it could be somewhere else even, when all of a sudden the Spirit of God was moving in, a, in such a way, and, and all of a sudden you didn't really care about what happened to you necessarily, but you wanted to watch and see what God was doing in somebody's life? Have y'all ever been there? You know, I've been, I've been there a lot of times. I just love to watch the Spirit of God move. So there had to be a moment when somebody or a lot of people said, Wow. 
This is incredible. I don't care about the food so much anymore. I just want to watch and see what Jesus does. I want to see him continuing to divvy this out. Don't you know that was incredible? I will tell you right now that we need to see miracles every day of our lives. Amen. We need to see God moving in our lives every single day. How do we do that? How do we get there? We get there by believing and having faith. Give Jesus praise this morning, if you will. But I mean, this had to be exciting. It's kind of like, you know, I, I would imagine somebody, it may have been the little boy that originally had the, the fish and the loaves. He, pro, he may have been the one that said, somebody give me a camera quick. <laughs> no, I guess they didn't have iPhones back then, did they? But, but this had to be really cool. It had to be really amazing. So I find it so interesting and I find it so righteous that when all of that had just taken place, Jesus wasn't impressed. Jesus wasn't seduced by the crowd, by perhaps the applause, by the stares. But instead, Jesus just wanted to get away. They wanted to make him king. He was the king, amen? Amen. How thought-provoking is it that the king had come to earth to open up his kingdom and invite them in, but because of their blindness, they were planning to, be, to make him the king that they wanted him to be. They were trying to make him their king the way they wanted him to be king. I will tell you, Jesus Christ is king of kings and Lord of lords. Amen? Amen? So he turned his back on the crowd and he walks away to be by himself alone. He sends the others away because he was more focused on his heavenly father than upon any crowd that could show up that day. Give him praise again today for his goodness, for his power and his glory. So many people go through life and they're looking for a king or they're looking for a kingdom that fits the way they think it ought to be. Jesus doesn't share his kingdom with people, with mankind. Jesus is Lord, amen? We, we talk about democracies and republics and things like that. No, that's not the way God works. He is Lord of all, amen? Let's look closer at today's text. Uh, chapter six of the book of John, verse number 16 says, now when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. It says that they got into the boat and went over the sea toward Capernaum, and it was already dark, and Jesus had not come to them. If you look closely, you'll notice that it was actually Jesus' idea and Jesus' command for the disciples to get into the boat and to go away. This was his idea all along. He was about to challenge them. Some people like a challenge. Some people don't like a challenge. How many of you like a challenge? I sometimes like a challenge. I don't like storms, but I, I like a challenge sometimes. But you could correctly say that it was Jesus' will for them to go. He told them to go. That was Jesus' will. So the disciples headed out across the Sea of Galilee for one reason and one reason only, because Jesus Christ told them to go. Let's look at this. Matthew chapter 14, parallel passage, verse number 22. It says, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. So Jesus has them get into the boat and head out. It's dark, but that really shouldn't be a problem. Several of the disciples were fishermen, so I'm sure they understood uh, the area. They knew how to cross the Sea of Galilee. They were accustomed to fishing in this very location. This should not have been a big deal at all. They've done it many times, I'm sure. But who would have thought that Jesus would have knowingly sent them into a storm? Did Jesus know the storm was coming? One could argue that he already knew as the Son of God in touch with his Father. Whether, whether he did or not, though, this timely storm served to propagate faith in Jesus as the Son of God. And I'll prove that to you this morning. Amen. Go and give him praise today. It was the Christ, the Son of God. 
You know, no other miracle seems to have convinced the disciples that he was the Son of God. Puzzling to me, but it's, it's true. Remember why John wrote this gospel again, so that the people would believe. One of the primary reasons behind Jesus sending the disciples out on the Sea of Galilee that night was so that they, the disciples, would believe. You'd have thought they were already believing, wouldn't you? You'd have thought they'd already got this thing down, serving Jesus, being the disciple, uh, lots of faith, all this stuff. You'd have thought they would have got all that. I want to jump ahead for just a minute, though, and prove what I'm talking about today. In Mark chapter 6, in verse number 51, this is toward the end of the same parallel passage. We find it in three Gospels here. Mark chapter 6, verse 51. Then he, Jesus, went up into the boat. This is after all these things have happened, okay? Walking on the water, all that. Then, Je then he went up into the boat to them, and the wind ceased after the storm. The wind has ceased here, and it says they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marveled. And verse number 52 says, for they had not understood about the loaves, look at that, because their heart was hardened. The disciples, their heart was hardened and they didn't understand about the loaves. They didn't understand what that miracle was. You know, how about that? Many of the disciples are still having trouble believing. They're still having an issue with believing. Even after seeing 5,000 people, 5,000 men plus women and children, call it 15,000 people, whatever it is, they're still having trouble believing. I want you to think about this for just a second. Now, I didn't purposefully have them leave these buckets up here today, but pretend that I'm in a boat for just a second I've just come from this feeding of the 5,000. Now I'm in a boat. I'm out on the Sea of Galilee. A storm's coming up, and I'm all afraid. The disciples were very, very fearful. We'll get into that in just a minute. They're so fearful, but what they're not doing, apparently, is they're not looking around and seeing that I've still got the 12 baskets of, how many ever baskets they took with them? I've got the baskets of the miracle that Jesus did right at my feet, and I can't see it because the storm is happening around me. Sometimes you got to go back. You got to go back in your mind. You got to remember what God did for you. You've got to remember how Jesus saved you. You've got to remember how he pulled you out of something that there was no other way. You've got to remember that he touched your life. You would have been doomed, destined for failure, but God picked you up. He set you like he like you should be and you gave him glory. Somebody give him praise today in this place. This miracle convinced the disciples that Jesus truly was the Son of God. You know, surprisingly to me, and I don't really claim to understand it, but surprisingly to me, John doesn't give us all these details. As a matter of fact, uh, he doesn't give us a, a big part of the story here, and that was that this was the same night and this was the same storm where Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water. John doesn't tell us anything about that. But these are the same waves, these are the same cries, or these are the same screams. This is the same storm, the same winds are whirling around everywhere. But John doesn't seem to, to say anything about that. But my question this morning is this, why would Jesus send them out and from the mountain watch them struggle where they were at? Why would he do that? Watch them struggling in a fierce storm except that he already knew he was going to show up and take them out of the storm. Amen. Amen, somebody. Amen. This was all about truth, and this was about purpose, and this was about life. This was about believing. I will tell you, we will go through some stuff in life. We'll go through some spiritual storms in life. How many of you have been through one lately? There's several in here. You've been through a storm lately, and I will tell you, Jesus Christ will always meet you in the middle of your storm. He will always show up, and he will teach you something out of the Word of God. You open up your heart, he will teach you something profound out of his Word. But when all this is over, Matthew writes in Matthew chapter 14 and verse, verse number 33, he says, Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. Here again, you'd have thought they would already have gotten that. You'd have thought that would have sunk in, Brother Jamie, somewhere along the way. Listen to me this morning. As a disciple of Christ, as a child of, 
Almighty God, every trial that you faced, every test that you faced, every storm that you faced, I will tell you that Jesus will be there as you walk through that. How do we know that? We know that by faith. We know that because the Word of God tells us He will never leave us nor forsake us. Now, I want to tell you something else right now, too. Sometimes we wonder, I'm just being honest with you today, sometimes we wonder, Jesus, where are you at in this? Faith says, Sister Debbie, faith says, you're right here with me. Every Sunday morning, I start to come out here and I walk start to walk out of the guest, start to open the door to the guest quarters and walk out of it. And I pray a prayer like this. Among other things, I say, Lord, anoint me today. Amen. You know what the first thing, first thing every time comes to my mind, he says, you already have an anointing. It's in the book. You already, and I say, thank you, Lord, for the anointing today. Thank you, Lord, for the anointing. No matter what you face in life, you can go to the Word and you will get the answers that you need. Amen. Give God praise again today. <laughs> but we feel sometimes scared, Brother Mark. Go through trouble and we feel scared. I, I mean, they felt scared. But I've come to tell you, there is no one on heaven and earth that has more compassion than Jesus Christ does for you. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's good preaching. He's talking to you today. So the next time you feel alone, you just talk to yourself. And you say, self, you're not alone. How many of y'all talk to yourself? I know y'all talk to yourselves. I've been around a few of them when you talk to yourself, and you didn't even know I was around, but I heard you talking to yourself. But this is a storm, and this is treacherous. I, I've, I've been there on the Sea of Galilee. I mean, the waves are bad. I mean, it can be really bad, considering it's, it's not a huge it's not a huge sea. It's more, it's called a lake sometimes. But I mean, it's miles this way and miles that away. But, but still yet, yeah, if you're out in the middle of that thing and you're in a storm, I'm telling you, it's a scary thing. And, and I'm sure for the disciples, they probably even are thinking at some point, you know, uh, their fate is a little bit unknown here. We don't know exactly what's going to happen. But then Jesus walked up. Here he comes walking on the sea. The master of the wind comes by. The keeper of your heart comes by. Amen. The maker of the universe comes by. Let's read it. Verse number 18 of John chapter 6. Then the sea arose because a great wind was blowing. So when they had rowed, what's that? About three or how many of you ever rowed a boat? So when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near the boat, and they were afraid. But he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. Then they willingly received him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. So by the time Jesus met them on the water, according to Mark's gospel, we know that they hadn't even reached halfway across the sea. They were going to the other side. They had been rowing for hours and hours and hours and barely gotten anywhere. I feel like I've been there in life sometimes. I'm rowing and I'm rowing and I don't feel like, you ever felt that way, anybody? Brother Jimmy, you ever felt that way? I feel like I'm just rowing, I'm just trudging along, but I'm not really going anywhere. I mean, you've got to realize that at some point your arms get tired. Fatigue sets in. Now, these are experienced fishermen, but they didn't plan on this storm coming up. And so they're rowing and they're rowing and they're rowing. They're seasoned, again, they're seasoned fishermen, but this was something they didn't expect that night. Sometimes storms just show up. What do we do? We, could, we look for Jesus. When a storm shows up, you look for Jesus, amen? But to add insult to injury here, Mark's gospel also tells us that Jesus, walking on the water, they're rowing, okay? Jesus, he's walking on the water. I don't know if they're turned around backwards, probably. And Jesus shows up. They're just trying to get through the storm. And they're not hardly moving. Jesus shows up, walking on the sea. 
Jesus is walking on the sea, and at a normal pace, Jesus is walking faster than they're struggling to row. The Bible says that Jesus could have passed them by. It actually says that he would have passed them by, and if he would have passed them by, that means he could have passed them by. And so they're just fighting it, they're fighting, and they're fighting, and they're fighting. Life is full of frustration sometimes. But they're fighting, they're struggling, they're tired, they're fatigued. I'm sure their arms are cramping up, feeling like they're going to fall off. And here comes Jesus just strolling along. <laughs> Sister Becky on the sea. He would have passed them by. Don't ever let Jesus pass you by Amen. when he's looking for you to call out to him. Amen. Give Jesus praise today if you would. Verse 48 of Mark chapter 6 says this. Then he saw them straining at rowing, for the wind was against them. Now about the fourth watch of the night, they've been there a long time. Dark happened a long time ago. This is likely like from 3 to 6 a.m. This is a long time later. Now about the fourth watch of the night, Jesus, uh, he came to them walking on the sea and would have passed them by. You know, I look at that, and I, I think, you know, I picture them rowing so hard, and they're struggling, they're tired, they're fatigued, they're aggravated, and Jesus just walking on by. I don't care who you are. That's a little bit funny, somebody. That's a little bit funny. For those of you wanting to make sure you do not have a pointless sermon today, write this down. How many of you know I didn't have any points last week? Somebody told me I had a pointless sermon. Write this down today. You can't always row yourself in your way out of a storm. Your effort will not always get you out of a storm. Sometimes you can get through things, but your, your own efforts, your own uh, fighting of it, that will not always get you out of a storm. You need Jesus Christ. Amen. If off, it often takes a storm, though, to expose the things in our lives that are actually holding us back. You see, that's the whole thing with this story today is that it exposed that they needed to recognize that Jesus was the Son of God who cared for them, who loved them, who would take care of them, who would walk on water if he had to to get to where they are at. Let me tell you that today in case you didn't get it. Jesus Christ will walk on water if he has to to get where you are at in life. Amen. Give him praise again this morning if you would. So many times we can rely on our talent, we can rely upon our skill and our knowledge, our health, our finances. We, we can rely on a lot of things to get us through the struggles of life, but Jesus Christ says, hey, just come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest today. For that person who needs rest in your life and in your body even, I will tell you, Jesus Christ will give that to you. He is the giver of life. He is the giver of the breath that we breathe. Surely he will see us through the storms of life. Amen? We need him. We need him, Sarah. We need him. Amen? You know, you can work yourself silly sometimes. I don't think that's politically correct either, but we can work ourselves silly trying to get to our divine destination, but only Jesus Christ will get us there. He is the only way. You can row, row, row your boat treacherously down the stream. Wear your arms out. But you're not going to get there without Jesus Christ. Amen. What else did we learn this morning? It's this. Without faith, miracles and signs aren't enough. I, I like when I walk through Sunday school, and I oftentimes hear about faith upstairs. I walk through that class uh, getting to the sound booth, and I often hear about faith and serving God and, and uh, listening to God, hearing from God, and flowing with God, things like that. The miracle of Jesus walking on water set up Peter's faith to be challenged. Let's go there today, Matthew chapter 14. It's almost 12 o'clock, so we'll be finished soon. Well, 12.03. Matthew chapter 14, verse 28. Remember I told you this was the same storm, the same waves, 
This was the same situation as John wrote about. But here we have another detail that, that John didn't add in here, perhaps because having to do with, John wrote his gospel many, many, many years after uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke did. Okay, so maybe it was just understood this was part of it. But anyway, Matthew chapter 14, verse 28, and Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, this is the guy who just watched 5,000 plus people being fed. They've seen all these other miracles. And Peter said, you know, there are times that it's, it's one thing to trust God in certain situations, but it's another thing when he asks you to walk on water. I don't know who I'm talking to this morning, but when he really asks you to step out of the boat that you're in, that you're comfortable in, amen. He said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, oh, you of little faith. He said, he said why did you doubt? You were already walking. Why did you doubt? I, stand with me today. I'm going to close right there. But why did you doubt? I want you to think about this for just a second. As I just told you, Peter is already walking on the water. He's doing pretty good. A lot of people gripe at Peter for, for not having faith here. At least he got out of the boat. At least he got out of the boat. There are Christians today who they're not getting out of the boat. Well, I don't want to rock the boat. No pun intended, Rodney. No pun intended. I, you know, I don't want to stir things up. Somebody might make fun of me or something. Oh, I better not go there. We don't have time for that. I could, Brother Lindell, I could preach on that for a while. Sometimes we need to step out of the boat. Amen, somebody. Amen. You know, I've known people, though, who were waiting on a miracle, thinking that a miracle would solidify their faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. They've waited for a miracle. Knowing Jesus is about believing and having faith, we get it. People get it backwards sometimes. Well, if, if God would give me a miracle, then I'd believe. No. He says, you know me. Believe in me. Trust in me. And then I'll take care of all those other things. I'll send the miracles. I'll, 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 send, I'll send whatever I have to do. I'll meet you in the middle of a, of a stormy sea if I have to. But I want you to understand that today, that We've got to have faith first. We need to be people of faith, as a matter of fact. Amen? Amen? Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior forever. How do I know that? How do I know that? You say, well, the Bible says uh, that if you confess, he forgives us. Y'all read that in the book? And then we're on our way to heaven. Give a simplified version here. Watch this, though. The other thing that happens, though, is when I have faith and I believe, then his spirit bears witness with my spirit that I am a child of God. Amen. That does not happen by natural means at all. That is a supernatural thing, Brother Jimmy. The reason you know you're saved is because there was a day that you gave your heart and life to Jesus Christ and you trusted him, you believed him, and there's nothing unless you want to walk away from God. There is nothing can take you from that, from that relationship, unless you want to turn your back on him. But I will tell you, how do I know that I'm saved? 
my heart was changed. My life was changed. The greatest miracle you will ever experience is when he changes your heart. And you know on the inside, I am a child of Almighty God. Amen. Bow your head with me if you would today. Father, thank you for the supernatural experience that we have in coming to know you. Lord, I also thank you that in the midst of every storm in life, no matter where it is, uh, who it involves, uh, the situation, whatever it is, no matter what the storm is, Lord God, we can trust that you will always be there. But Lord, we do that by first knowing who you are, surrendering our lives completely. Not part way, not, not 50%, not even 95%, but Lord, surrendering our lives completely to you. So Lord, today, God, I ask you to speak to our hearts that there would be a total surrender. Lord, for somebody today, there would be a total surrender of their lives to Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. With no one looking around, I just want to ask a question today. Are you here in this service right now or you're watching online and you say, Pastor, just to be very, very honest, I have never completely surrendered my life. I'm going to tell you, if you haven't completely surrendered your life, it's hard for God to work in your life. If you say, Pastor, I need to completely surrender my life today, would you pray for me? And I see your hand right up and right back down. Pray for me. It can be young, old, or somewhere in between. But I need Jesus. I need forgiveness. I need his, his work in my life. Who would say today, Pastor, pray for me. I need to surrender. How many of you would say today, Pastor, even right now, I'm going through a storm in my life, and I just need Jesus to show up. Can I see your hand? I need Jesus to show up, yeah. I need him, and I trust him. Hallelujah. If y'all would look at me for just a minute, in just a moment, we're going to pray a prayer, and, and we're going to trust that God will move in your situation. I don't know what all the needs are here today. I don't know. You remember what I said a while ago in the text, how the disciples are out there in the boat. They're struggling. They're frustrated. But Jesus was actually watching them from where he was at. He hadn't lost track of where they were. He didn't get confused on, you know, are they really, I know it's dark, but are they really out there in that part of the store? No, he knew exactly where. Jesus knows exactly where you are at. Amen. He knows exactly where you're at. Let's pray. Father God, today, Lord, as various ones, Lord, today are going through situations and Lord God, even some who are considering today, God, uh, total surrender of their lives. God, I pray that you keep knocking on our heart's door. God, keep knocking on the doors of our heart until we totally surrender our lives. Lord God, I pray for those today that were uh, in a situation where they just need you to show up. Lord, thank you for your word that declares to us today that you are there all the time. You are ever present in our lives. Thank you, Lord, for that. Pray, God, today that you would just touch. Lord, even for those that are at home right now, I pray, God, you touch their lives in a special way in the mighty and wonderful name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.